This is All Things Considered on GPB. I'm Peter Biello. LeBron James is arguably the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. Some argue even better than Michael Jordan. But James brought more than tremendous skill to the court. He brought black culture, and in doing so, turned the game into a showcase for it. In her new book, The Book of James, The Power, Politics, and Passion of LeBron, Emory University professor Valerie Babb illuminates the many ways James proudly displayed black culture, pushed for social pushed for social and political change, and invested in children who, like him, grew up in poor, unstable homes. Valerie Babb, welcome to All Things Considered. Hello, Peter. It's my pleasure to be here. So this book, I really enjoyed it. It offers two things simultaneously. It offers um, a look at LeBron's rise to prominence uh, and also the way white America perceived him uh, and the, the racist tropes that he encountered along the way. And it started in high school. Uh, I did not know this. I wasn't following this at the time. Um, he was uh, more than just a talented player on the court. Can you tell us a little bit first about how he grew up? Wow. It almost seems like that is a story that should be so well known in American culture. But I think some of the more important and moving details that affect him as an adult emerge then. Everybody knows he grew up very poor in Akron, Ohio, with a single mother. But he has just transformed that pretty traditional narrative to highlight how that really does represent overcoming in its best sense. He, as a child of a single mother, has gone out of his way to emphasize that that is a family. He completely takes it out of the way we want to frame that. He reframes impoverishment, not as something that is permanent, but as something that one can, with some luck, with some help, something that he will provide to future generations, get out of and make their own way. So whatever his circumstances were growing up, he has completely transformed them to make them work, not just for him, his family, but for a larger segment of Ohio and American society as well. I also love the fact that his home was a few miles from where John Brown, the abolitionist home, was as well. So it is, excuse me, LeBron James Way, um, the street that memorializes him is a few miles from John Brown's home. And so that kind of gives that echo of LeBron as a freedom fighter as well. And I think all of that comes into play in addition to his being one of the best basketball players we've ever seen. Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of what you just <laughs> talked about, right? The, the, the way he is um, pushing for progress off the court. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, though, a, a little bit um, to start with his earlier life is his uh, one of the first examples of him sort of being targeted in, in a way for, for his talent, but also his family being targeted. You mentioned mm-hmm. family being an important thing for him. Uh, and that was when he was in high school. And his mother borrowed against his future NBA earnings to buy him a Hummer. I mean, even in high school, for those who don't know, um, he was, you know, everybody could see that he was destined to be this huge sensation in the NBA. And so he had this remarkable capital built up waiting to be utilized. And so his mother drew on that to uh, reward him with a Hummer. And this uh, this drew him uh, basically a target on his back in, in, in a variety of ways. Could you talk a little bit about what happened? Well, part of it was the timing. We are in the midst of Reaganomics and the Reagan era aftermath, and everything is about pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. The narrative is constantly targeting people like LeBron and his mother as examples of the wastrels who are barreling through federal aid and doing nothing to improve themselves, their situation, or their family. So this is a landscape that he emerged on, and that kind of narrative followed him all the way through high school. He was expected to go to an all-black basketball powerhouse in Akron, but he and his friends, kind of foreshadowing what would happen later, decided they would go to St. Mary's. And St. Mary's being predominantly white, this team being the first almost all black team at the high school led to all of those kinds of racial associations that were just kind of floating in the 80s and 90s, taking direct aim at him and his mother. So she did do something that any mother of a prominent future star probably would have done, but because she was black and poor, because he was black and poor, because they fell outside the standard two-parent household, they became a lesson, if you will, in what not to do to become a decent member of society. So he took a lot of heat for 
representing something that was actually in people's imagination that had nothing to do with his own reality. Yeah, the the real world consequences was that he uh, uh, allegedly ran afoul of a rule where you couldn't accept gifts, and they were like, "How did you get this Hummer?" Right, and and he he uh, they were questioning his ability to play because of this gift, and then they had, and so his mother had to sort of show all the paperwork, I guess. And, and yes. Um, Reporters had said that she underwent the kind of scrutiny the IRS reserves for billionaires with offshore accounts just because she bought her son that car based on his future earnings. Yeah. And and even though it was determined later that it was totally fine. Completely. According to the rules. Yes. People were still saying, uh, well, she should have known that this scrutiny would have happened even if it was uh, above board. Right, right. And I think that shows us the expectations that are placed on people like LeBron James and his mother, people who are black and people who are poor. The rules for them are just different somehow. Right, right. And one of the points in this book that still uh, is ringing in my head is that, you know, he was getting criticized for accepting a multi-million dollar contract right, right outside of high school. But and people were like, how could he do that? How could he do that? Because he's foregoing his education. But I, I can't say I've ever heard that once about anyone joining a minor league baseball team for what, $20,000 Minor year? league baseball. Hockey. hockey. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right. So what is it that is well, causing that criticism? And it's race. It is his blackness. Absolutely. And that has been part of a long running narrative. I was a professor at Georgetown University before coming to Emory and the basketball team there face that narrative as well. Oh, you're going to leave this chance as a great education to go do this. And also ignoring many of the younger people who would leave Georgetown to go work in their parents' corporation, for example, and decide, Mm -hmm. okay, we'll come back a little bit later and get that. So again, we see racial expectations kind of unleveling the playing field, Mm -hmm. if I may. Yeah. And and that is Um, The racial expectations inside the NBA, too, is something that you comment on here. Um, A a predominantly black league owned predominantly by white owners, uh, which creates its own tense dynamic, especially when labor negotiations come into play. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And especially against the backdrop of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. If we look at what does white ownership and Black being owned, there is one institution, Nikki Haley didn't like to refer to it, but there is one institution that that replicates. And I don't think that we can underestimate the power of that in terms of how each group approached the other. Mm -hmm. And LeBron, uh, his power, his um, strength on the court translated to uh, cultural capital in a way where he had the the strength to use his voice against owners who acted like they were plantation owners and pushed back. He used that power to the advantage of not only himself, but his fellow players. And that is one of the things I think I admire about him. He does not transcend one of my favorite words, his blackness. Mm-hmm. He places it as central to who he is, what he does, and what his mission is. I Almost would maybe flip that in that I think that he was such a good athlete that that then allowed him to become the social representation he became. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a huge contrast to someone like Michael Jordan, right, who uh, came to prominence in the 1980s uh, where the the era of Reagan mm-hmm. and uh, he famously – didn't engage with racial politics of any kind. He didn't want to alienate uh, the white buyers of cheeseburgers and the other things that he <laughs> endorsed. Um, uh, but LeBron is the exact opposite of that. He is very willing to talk about the causes that that matter to him. Um, and there are a variety of ways you, you make that clear in this book. But one way I found really fascinating, and I wanted to ask you about it, um, it was the contrast between the Michael Jordan Space Jam movie in the <laughs> 90s and the the Space Jam featuring LeBron. Yes. And there are several storytelling elements that really illuminate the value differences between those two people. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what those were. If we look at the Michael Jordan Space Jam, he is really like an object among other objects. He is at first a baseball player and the owners just want to keep him happy so he has a team um, assistant assigned to him. He then becomes an object that will help the Looney Tunes win 
against this m- evil, evil um, uh, owner of Magic Mountain. LeBron's Space Jam is a story of a human being, not an object. It is a father who is going after the son that has been taken away from him. Michael Jordan's Space Jam, it's just him and cartoon characters. LeBron James's Space Jam, it's him, his family, and then cartoon characters. But that whole idea of black humanity, black family, the mother, the sons, the ancillary people who surround them and become that larger community, that is as much of a focus in James's Space Jam as the cartoons are. Once again, putting family Family at the center. and humanness, I think, too. Mm-hmm. We can't abstract LeBron James in his Space Jam because clearly he is always the father, even though he is LeBron James. We can kind of ex- ex- uh, abstract Michael Jordan in his movie because he is just such a, he is as cartoonish, and I don't mean his behavior, but I mean his dimensionality is as cartoonish as the other two dimensional animated um, characters there. And again, that's not a hit on him. It's just how the movie has framed his character. Right, right. Um, well, there's another dimension worth discussing, uh, and that's LeBron's, uh, the way he's painted himself in these endorsement commercials that he's done. And and one way you describe it, and I can't remember which specific commercial, forgive me, but uh, you, you write that he is putting uh, ordinary black life at the center of it. And that is important. Uh, could you talk about why? Yeah, um, we tend to look at blackness, especially in the United States, in terms of extremes. You are either Oprah Winfrey or you are a welfare mother. You are either Michael Jordan or you are a criminal thug. And a lot of black life exists in between those. Most of black life exists in between those, where people are worried about ordinary things, getting kids educated, getting a house, having enough food to eat. And so that is the kind of ordinariness that LeBron James centers in his commercials. My favorite is the LeBrons, where one cultural critic said, Nothing is happening here, and I don't know who these people are. That's the one where there are four different versions of LeBron James right. kind of superimposed <laughs> in the same scene. And you describe that that critic as not really understanding what this is about, but it's one of those if you know, you know kind of situations. <laughs> exactly. And that, I think, is precisely the guts that LeBron James and Nike exhibited in making those commercials. They didn't shy away from the if you know, you know. They didn't put extra explications in there for those who might not know. It was on you to know or find out. Yeah. Um, I, and if you know and it clicks with you, you're like, that's that's a genius move right it there. It was brilliant, right. Yeah. And all of those characters that he represents, I grew up with. The OG, the athlete, the businessman who's always got to hustle, always going someplace. The young kid uncertain as to what his future like. We all know those folk, especially if you grew up in a black community. They're very familiar to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of his protests are quite explicit, unlike the subtlety of some of those commercials, right? He is uh, wearing shirts that say, I can't breathe Mm -hmm. Um, and various other examples uh, to that level. Could you talk about the significance of him doing something like that? I think increasingly we live in a visual culture where we understand things through what we see. And one of the things we see so frequently are stars, are celebrities. And LeBron James realizes that and is very aware of how that projection can then be used to influence um, attitudes, values, and assumptions. So rather than be concerned about his professional career, he has used his fame and prominence to register voters, to argue for women's rights and inclusion, to argue for um, protocols to help NFL players with concussions, to argue for essentially what we're fighting for right now, democracy, voting, and a fair society. Mm -hmm. Um, LeBron's efforts off the court, they include uh, educational efforts for children, particularly in in Akron, Ohio. Mm -hmm. The I Promise School, uh, which is... uh, a school that it's still part of the Akron public school system. Yes, but and he, that's the key point. Mm-hmm. What? Why is that key? I think it's key because what happens in a public school can be used to influence other public schools. The curricula that is developed there might be used as curricula elsewhere. The test preparation that is developed there might be used elsewhere. So what 
I Promise really is is sort of a laboratory in a way for political educational reform. And there's a certain degree of accountability that goes with that in terms of testing, in terms of um, transparency. Charter schools don't always have that. They can take public monies or they can't. They can accept just about everyone or they can restrict who their students will be based on perhaps even religious um, grounds or something like that. So there is less accountability and I would argue actually less reach, less ability to be able to be the cohesive factor that public schooling can be in charter schools. We need things that build us together as a society. Obviously, everyone's looking around now and asking, why are we at each other's throats? Part of that is because over the last 30 or 40 years, we have cut funding to public schools, cut funding to those institutions that help us to learn together, grow together. And this this is the result. Mm -hmm. You write in this book that um, the I Promise School, it's outperforming the district uh, when it comes to standardized tests anyway. We'll say that. Um, But underperforming the state. But it also does a lot of things that you can't really measure. Like it's got a food pantry. It's got on-site um, social workers. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, the the discipline policies are not those that um, would be what you call the school-to-prison pipeline type, right? They're, they're looking at the whole student and really checking in with them to see what the root of any problem is, uh, which is uh, uh, arguably getting some results, though not necessarily turning up in the standardized tests. And I think LeBron James reveals so much about us. It's surprising to me when I was writing the book that he also revealed the fallacy of standardized testing. Mm -hmm. Um, The I Promise School, the students that that school draws from are the bottom quarter of students in the area. In terms of standardized tests, they are struggling. They have improved, but they are still struggling. In terms of tests that register, excuse me, in terms of tests that register emotional well-being, emotional maturity, growth while in school, that is where they are outperforming every other school in their district. So it's a question of what you measure and when do you measure it? Mm-hmm. Do you expect someone who has had nothing to all of a sudden get into school and perform well in a standardized test? I think not. There has to be some test and something that goes before that. Mm-hmm, right. And mm-hmm. he's, he's said himself, and you quoted him here, saying, this is a years-long effort. It's oh, going to yes. take a long time. Yes. Um, but, but, but worth explaining in, in terms of figuring out what's important to this man and why is, he, why is he doing it? Why is he investing the money the way he does? Um, and what's interesting also is, um, as you pointed out, there is the school. There is the pantry within the school. But now, I promise, has become an entire network. Mm-hmm. There is a beautiful old apartment building that he bought and refurbished for transitory families who are looking for some place to go. Families like his, because he some, missed a lot of school right, when he was a kid. Exactly. Families like his. There is a domestic violence center. There is now um, a health care center that is being built there as well. So it is a network, a community organizational building. Um, ac- oh, house. I'm blanking on it, but House 365? <laughs> it's the area code. Yes, the it's area code. Whatever the area code is in Akron. <laughs> right. Um, although I think now they have two, so. <laughs> okay, one of them. <laughs> right. One, one of, of the them. area codes of Akron, <laughs> right. But it's a whole complex in that area. So he's really also rebuilding Akron, the city, which started with this one school, but has now just reached out beyond that. Yeah, and and just... just um, Again, that's one of many things that one he's of done. Many, yeah. to, to and and he's still he's still he's doing all this while he's also in the in the twilight of his uh, throughout his can- ba- basketball career. He's been doing all right. these things. Um, so LeBron's playing days are nearing their end, and I'm wondering what you think his post uh, playing career will be like when it comes to his activism and his philanthropy. When, once he ha- once he can do that full time, what what do you think it's going to look like? <laughs> I am trying to imagine that myself, mainly because he's kind of accomplished all of that already. So part of me would say, oh well, maybe because he's so passionate about education, he'll go into the field of education and see what he can improve there. Ah, uh, I promise, he's already done that. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe in terms of economics, he will assist other black businesses and other black creators to get to the area and the field of making money that he did. He's already done that. So even though he is at the height of his career in many ways or 
maybe the twilight. Um, he has already accomplished off the court things that I don't think anyone would have expected him to accomplish. The last thing I want to add to that, too, is also just the way he has influenced art and style. I don't know of a more fashionable athlete than LeBron James. Uh, I don't know of an athlete that has collected interesting pieces of art the way he has. And the way he has, for example, built a relationship with the African-American Memorial Museum of the Smithsonian Museums assures me that I think he's going to be a real cultural influencer. He's very much aware about how celebrity influences how we understand our world. And I think his efforts are going to go towards those things that will help us to do that better, whether that is in creating school materials, whether that is creating media of all kinds, oral, visual, all that depends. And that's why I think my next book would want to be to dive into that part of his brain. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you have reached out to him for uh, a conversation, uh, and he's not yet replied, but can't rule it out. We're hopeful. We're hopeful. <laughs> Ever hopeful. <laughs> so so uh, what would you want to ask him uh, about specifically? I, <laughs> if you, I guess if you had one or two questions real quick to ask him, like what... You only, um, he's only got 10 minutes. Yeah. What, are you, what are you going to ask him? I would paraphrase what I closed the book with, the conversation between Spike Lee and Fran Lebowitz, where he asked about Michael Jordan, how the F did he do that? Hmm. That and, was a conversation about whether what Michael Jordan was doing is art, can is be considered art. art. Right. And Lebowitz was arguing, it's no. more like dance, but not really art. And, mm-hmm. and Spike Lee was like, absolutely, it's art, because <laughs> right. you're watching him do it, and you're like, how? How? How does this happen? And she says uh, something like, you won't even remember that years from now. And obviously, false. Spike Lee <laughs> Spike Lee says, <laughs> absolutely her, false. Right. <laughs> right. And he says, how the F does he do that? And I think that would be my question to LeBron. How the blank did you know that you would be able to get yourself and your mother out of that situation. How did you do that? How did you keep your head on when you have a hundred people telling you to go in a hundred wrong ways and you somehow were able to keep that straight? How did you realize that everything around you was not the most important thing around you and that things like education, political involvement, social justice were more important? So many athletes get off of that road, how the does he do that to maintain <laughs> that kind of focus? So, yeah, I have a whole bunch of those how the blank questions for him. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm sure a lot of questions for LeBron if he does get back to you, and I hope he does. Uh, uh, Emory University professor uh, Valerie Babb, thank you so much for talking with, me, talking with me about your book. Really appreciate it. This has been such a pleasure, Peter. Thank you.